All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I have the honor tonight of handing out two awards, the first of which is our Conservative Mind Award. We're big fans of Russell Kirk here at the American Conservative, so when we devised our award for young leaders, we thought there was no one better to name, to name it for. Kirk, of course, published his hugely influential work, The Conservative Mind, at just 35 years of age. He's putting us all to shame. But if there's anyone who is exercising more influence on the political debate today, it may just be our award winner tonight. Chris Rufo is rewriting the book on how conservatives should win the culture war. He has emerged as America's leading voice, speaking out against some of the most poisonous trends in our education system and public institutions, like critical race theory and gender ideology. Chris's work is also getting real results. It has directly led to legislation in 22 states and a presidential order. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and also an accomplished writer and filmmaker. He is also, like me, a fellow Georgetown grad, and I hope you won't hold that against him. I don't think we'll see either of us in the alumni magazine anytime soon. But on a personal note, as a dad of three daughters, I'm incredibly grateful for Chris's tireless advocacy for parents and children, and I'm honored to present him with Tax Conservative Mind Award. Please join me in welcoming Chris Rufo. I won, all right, great. I'll show my mother. This is great, I'm at 38, so I snuck right in for the under 40 awards. Um, that's great. So, um, I mean, first of all, it's great to be here. It's great to be with all of you. I've met many of you, meeting other people for the first time. Um, I actually live in a small town in Washington State. Um, I don't have any political or intellectual friends. I'm kind of an odd duck there, uh, but I feel very at home here. So it's, uh, it's quite a scene change. Um, so it's quite an honor to celebrate my success over the last two years, uh, exposing critical race theory in the, in, in the institutions, exposing gender ideology, particularly in schools. Um, but what I'd like to talk about briefly is not what has happened, not some of the progress that we've made, but some of the progress we can continue to make in the future. And I think part of the problem that we have is that we aren't thinking big enough. We aren't meeting the scale of the challenge uh, with the scale of the solutions that are going to be required to face it. And I really do two things. I have kind of a, a split day. Uh, part of what I do is what you probably have seen on Fox News or at New York Post. Um, I deal in the most uh, shocking and salacious muckraking uh, and spectacle, uh, dredging up documents from public institutions and private institutions um, that are that kind of news that travels at the speed of light um, because it has uh, uh, in, inherently loaded with, with controversy and with energy. Um, and that's a big part of it. That's a big part of how I've been able to motivate people, get parents involved, get legislators involved, move the great wheels of public opinion. When I started reporting on critical race theory, the name recognition for CRT was really rounded down to 0%. Outside of a very small group of specialists, no one had heard of critical race theory. By the time we got this great wheel of public opinion churning with the help of people like Tucker Carlson and Mark Meadows and Donald Trump, uh, we got name recognition up to 75%. So we educated about 150 million Americans about a obs formerly obscure uh, neo-Marxist theory, and we shifted public opinion two to one in our favor. These are, hey, thanks, that's great, yeah. Then we had, a, of course, a presidential order, and when Donald Trump touches something, it becomes immediately a, a national focus uh, um, um, and, 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 and a kind of lightning rod effect. Um, and then state legislators, state legislators came through in 22 states to start restricting this ideology in schools. But simultaneously, as I was, I was doing this activism work, the media work, um, dealing in those 30-second sound bites, those shocking 20-second video clips um, uh, in the investigative sense, I was also doing my homework working backwards. I say, well, where does this stuff come from? How does it work? How does it gain power? How is it that in 1969, this ideology was restricted to a very small group of maybe 100 left-wing Marxist radicals and is now in almost every elementary school uh, in states like California and New York and Illinois. How did these ideas work through the institutions, 
How did they conquer territory intellectually? And then how did they conquer territory at the level of the, the prosaic and in, in actual the hearts and minds and bodies and voices and documents within the great bureaucracies of our country? And I think that this is where we have to go. The answer, as many of you already know, as the American conservative has documented for years, is the long march to the institutions. And I think we've done a good job at starting to raise awareness about the problem. Certainly, whenever I, wherever I go and wherever people who are in, in political life go, parents and voters and, and people who care about this country are deeply concerned about the capture of our institutions that is really, in a sense, deliberately designed as a revolution from above. They knew that they could never gain power through the democratic process. They could never win a majority. So they said, we're going to capture the key institutions in the United States and then use the bureaucracies to impose it on people from above outside of the democratic process. And so I would, I would challenge people in this room who I think agree with the premise, agree and celebrate the progress we've made, to start thinking about how we can go much bigger, how we can go much deeper in challenging this problem and essentially designing a strategy to counter the, ca the capture of the institutions, which I think of as the siege of the institutions. And this is really what it's gonna take. Uh, we're gonna have to disrupt the bureaucracy, disrupt funding, disrupt grant making, disrupt this insidious DEI ideology that has captured all of the Fortune 100 companies, and then start reactivating these questions as political questions. Because look, we don't operate in a laissez-faire world. The government controls 90% of schools, 75% of universities, and by the civil rights apparatus, 100% of the human resources departments in our, in, our, in, our, in our corporations. And so we're dealing with problems that are political in nature, they're public in nature, and yet we've delegated them to radical ideologues that have taken over from the inside and then operate with impunity. I think that has to stop and it has to stop now. And so what I'm doing, uh, and I hope uh, others will join me, I'm reaching out to many of the people, many people including people in this room with more expertise than I have, is actually to say how can we reinvigorate the, the democratic will. Voters do not want critical race theory. Voters do not want DEI departments. Voters do not want gender ideology teaching uh, kindergartners that they might be pansexual. This is something that nobody voted for, nobody wants. It's opposed by somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of the public, and yet it's everywhere. We need to bring these questions back to the public process. We need to design legislation to start reshifting and reorienting American institutions. We are going to have public institutions. Uh, we're going to have them for the foreseeable future. And so the question is, how do we orient those towards the values of the people who send politicians to state houses and Congress to reflect the values of the common citizen rather than try to wage war against the common citizen from above? And so I hope we can do it. We're going to need a tremendous amount of energy for this fight. We're going to need a lot of leadership, and it's going to come from people in this room. Uh, I hope we can do it. Thank you so much.